Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A special topic that I want to do tonight on cultural appropriation. And I know this is a sort of vexed and controversial topic, but I do think it's important to think about, uh, particularly given the contemporary climate surrounding these sorts of issues. And uh, I've been in communication with a couple of people who have been vexed by this issue, and I just thought it was worth taking a moment to reflect on the complexities, subtleties, uh, and issues surrounding this. Um, but I think generally it's a very problematic idea, and I think you'll see why as we go along. First, just a rough definition, because it's always good to start with definitions. And I think um, one uh, way, and this is common, I looked at several different ones, but it's sort of the unacknowledged or inappropriate use of one society's or group's customs, practices, or art um, by another, usually more dominant culture, without, again, without attribution or in an inappropriate way. And often this has to do with issues of identity and cultural uniqueness and these sorts of issues. So that's the idea. Is that, so it's the unacknowledged or inappropriate uh, use or exploitation or theft of another culture's art or identity or religious, often symbolism or languages or dance of these kinds of things um, without acknowledgement or, you know, in some way that's inappropriate and destructive. So that's the idea. Now, this is not a, a controversial idea that this happens, so I think this is, this is perfectly clear. Um, but I want to create some context for this and understanding its modern, uh, how this seems to be deployed in the modern world. First, though, now that we have that definition, I want to frame this within the context of, of what I think, because I do think there's some core principles here that are rarely articulated, and that there's a big danger that these uh, debates often uh, run into. <clears throat> and so to me, I use this as a working assumption, is, is that there is uh, a common humanity amongst all people, um, and that is at some fundamental level, Every culture, every society, every subgroup uh, has experiences and ideas and emotions and um, feelings and art and thought and philosophy that are can be shared and are valuable. And that, that we are sufficiently similar and the human experience is sufficiently universal that it can be communicated and it can enrich and in value everyone who, who's able to take it seriously or, or encounter it and experience it. And uh, you know, there's any number of ways to, to talk about this, but two, I think, great examples are one is the Ep Epic of Gilgamesh, written many thousands of years ago by a vanished culture in a language that was mostly lost. When it was finally resurrected, um, again, after having been untold and unknown for you know, millennia, it was immediately moving and powerful and became one of the great classics of world literature, A, because of its uniqueness and because of its age, but B, because it told a story of friendship and death and a striving for immortality and the challenges of life that resonated over that vast difference of language and experience and time uh, and civilizations, I mean, you could, you know, it's so remote and yet so powerfully present and so powerfully human. Um, and so uh, that just seems real. And, and a second example, which I'll use a couple of times, is where I am now near the Lascaux cave paintings. These are cave paintings that were done 17,000 years ago. They're at different ages, but the oldest ones seem to be around, you know, 17 to 20,000 years old. And I haven't talked to anybody who's gone to see these paintings who were not moved, often moved quite powerfully by their ability to speak across, you know, again, this, this chasm. We don't know the animals. We don't know why they were painting them. We don't know uh, what the mean. We have no idea what the meaning of these paintings were. Um, what their in symbolic importance might be, if any, were they religious in nature? We're not, you know, so there's all these questions around them, and yet you go in and you feel them and you just go, you know, you're moved. They're, you're moved. And then a lot of people have said, not original with me, I think Andre Malraux, who was also involved in the cave painting, says in Voices of Silence that whenever you find, however far back you find art, it's always good. 
right? It's like, wow, it's always impressive, right? You're like, oh, this is 5,000 euros. They were already making really powerfully, amazingly good art, right? Like it's, it seems to be innate in, in, in humanity or at least a good part of it. And so I take this as a given that it is important and valuable to recognize this shared core of human experience and capacity and that there is something to be communicated from every society that, that can enrich everyone else. Um, the problem with not feeling that way, of course, I think is probably pretty obvious, is as you sort of run a little bit counter to that and you start saying, no, 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 there's societies, there's ideas, there's cultures, there's people that are so unique that they, d they don't have a shared common humanity, that they don't have this uh, thing of valuable that can be communicated. They're just too different. What they have is for them and what he, we have is for us. And they shouldn't be cross-populated. They shouldn't because that would destroy what they have and that really doesn't communicate or mean to us. Now, historically, that's been a very prevalent attitude, by the way. And this is why the history of, of uh, culture is not appropriation, but burning, destroying, tearing down, <laughs> you know, just... <laughs> Uh, salting the earth, right? You, you, you come, you conquer, and you go, well, these people are second rate. How do we know they're second rate? Because we just conquered them and we enslaved them. And so we're going to burn their books and, and destroy the face their art. And that, that, you know, history speaks pretty clearly that this was a very common practice, again, all over the world in many, many different times, right? Many different civilizations. So um, I think the notion that there is something of value to be shared and experienced in all human production and societies and groups and subgroups and civilizations is vastly, vastly uh, more positive and more accurate, I believe both, um, than, than the alternatives, which tend to lead to wholesale destruction and attempts to erase other cultures uh, from the face of the earth. And again, I would just off the top of my head, one in, in ancient Egypt and the distant other societies as well, they would periodically like carve off the faces of old pharaohs, put their faces on, and just claim all the things that the other pharaoh had done. Like, let's just erase that art. Let's erase those great ca carvings because of political expediency. Let's destroy their memory. Let's tear down the city that they built or, you know, deface the temples to some god we don't like anymore. These sorts of, of traditions. The Taliban has, has done this with some uh, Buddhist art. They aren't appropriating it. They're blowing it up because it's an aff affront to their religious beliefs and they don't want the, the, the great Buddhist artworks to be around. And so, you know, it, it's, it seems much better to uh, be arguing about and from within the context of this notion of a shared common humanity that has some things to offer um, and to be developed and, and to grow and to flower and to flourish and to influence over time. So I'm, again, I'm very strongly biased in that direction because I think it's just a better way to approach it. So there's a number of ways uh, the, the, the notion of appropriation is d discussed, but I think in deployment is very different than how it's often sort of you know, framed. So first thing you can say is like there's theft or crime. So like theft and crime is theft and crime. We have courts for this. If you steal somebody's uh, art or all this, like, you know, we know that's wrong. It's literally against the law. You have courts to adjudicate this. And these cases are successfully brought. So um, in that case, right, and there's a great history of this, right, because, you know, blues music was famously recorded and sold without the original artist getting any credit. You have all, you know, basically the art world spends who knows how much time involved in arguments about provenance, which is who owns what. I mean, because it is such a vexed question. So much art has been stolen, so much art has been lost in history and then reappears and, and you know, wars and all of these sorts of things. So the, the provenance and history of art. Now we, have, now we have copyright laws that are supposed to protect artists and their productions. Um, and so usually when you're talking about cultural appropriation, you can talk about just straight theft. But usually this isn't what people are talking about because in the case of straight theft of copyright or these kinds of issues, then you have, um, a, you basically have clear judicial recourse and it's, it's, it's pretty black and white-ish. You know, obviously there's all kinds of edge scenarios and all that, but generally straight theft and crime is usually not what people are, are complaining about. Um, 
The second version of this is like, because one of the issues of, of, of cultural appropriation is that it causes pain and suffering to people. And I'm in no way going to say that this is not true because it, clearly it does upset people. But it's important to remember that art often does upset people and often purposefully so. So in the United States, we had uh, this whole case of burning the flag, which eventually was found to be a, a, an expression of First Amendment privilege, free speech. <clears throat> and But it did upset people. People got really angry that other people were able to burn or deface the flag. They thought this was, this was a bad thing. It was a case of cultural destruction or threat or challenge. Uh, you also have the case uh, of things like uh, the Charlie Hebdo or when, when people, cartoons of, of the Prophet Muhammad that are done specifically to upset the, the Islamic community, right? The Muslim community. This is, it's not a mistake. It's not a, um, you know, aberration. They, they, they want to upset people. That is the point of what they're doing. So the cultural appropriation debates don't generally talk about that either because you can't really... What do you say to or argue with people if they're not breaking the law, but they are purposefully in trying to inflict harm and create controversy? Ah, so that's another category. But mostly what I think people are arguing about and where you see this is generally unintentional, what I'll call unintentional or a cultural appropriation from ignorance. And this, um, or, or where it may not even be a case of cultural appropriation. And this raises all kinds of vexed issues. And it's like, oh, if a student, say, is raised in a very conservative area, this is an actual example from history, by the way, raised in a very conservative area of uh, the United States, they, they're raised in the Christian church, they see lots of images of Christ all the time, they get inspired by reading the Quran, and they go, oh, you know, what, why isn't there a like, graphic novel of the Prophet Muhammad? Right. So now some people might think, well, this is obvious. Ah, well, it's not obvious if you're largely ignorant of one tradition, but inspired by it. But you grew up in a tradition where, hey, there's lots of images of Jesus all over the place. Why? You know, I've never I don't see any of Muhammad. Ah, right. Like so this is not a purposeful attempt to be, uh, you know, sort of disturb controversy. It is a, it was, you know, just ignorance or or our lack of awareness of what the meaning of those images might be. And so you're like, okay, here's an example where you're like, all right, well, maybe if you talk to this person, they might go, oh, wow, okay, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize this was a huge issue. But by the way, there were some Islamic cultures that did create images. There's illustrated books with images of the Prophet in them. So this is a, actually a new-ish See, this is where it gets so vexed, right? It's so hard to hold any of these, these rules down because this is actually not a universal law in the history of Islamic cultures, but it has become the dominant way of looking at this in the modern world, but this is not historically necessarily how uh, it has always been. There are many beautifully, beautifully um, Qurans that are illustrated with figures of people, including uh, the Prophet, of course, one of your main figures. So... You know, that tradition is there, although little discussed given the current political climate. And so you're like, okay, if someone is, that's a, you know, sort of an extreme example, but if you can move to even uh, more subtle ones. And so one of my favorite ones when, when I just talk to people about this is, you know, Bob Marley was criticized by some members of the Rastafari community, and they accused him of commercialization. Um, that he was integrating with the mainstream, um, and that he was not, he should not be wearing dreadlocks because he was not maintaining them properly, and he was using them more as a fascist statement than as a religious practice. And you can pretty much say that each of these claims is true. He was clearly commercializing because he wanted to spread his art and, and what he felt about the world. And to do that, he did have to interact with more mainstream culture. And so he did leave the sort of, you know, the Rastafari spends a lot of time criticizing Babel, Babylon, and which is the, you know, decadent interaction with the world. And it's like, well, how can you do that and then go out and interact with the decadent world? So that was a real issue. And then how he maintained his dreadlocks and whether he was sufficiently pure to do that is, you know, they, they were questioning this. And so I go, okay, now again, none of these charges are false. You can, you can find grounds to make all of these charges. 
And, but, and yet, would we rather say, hey, let's not have Bob Marley, let's not have his music, let's not have his influence, let's not have his voice out in the world, let's not have had the opportunity to the you know millions and millions and millions of people who were inspired by his music, inspired by his dress, inspired by his concepts and ideas. Oh, the entire fact, all of Rastafari and music, right? Should, should that be kept secret, kept private, kept only, you know, in Jamaica for only in one part of Jamaica for only a few people? Or should it be shared? Should it be distributed? Should it be everywhere in the world? And it's, it's, this, this raises, again, this really vexing question. Um, and one of the questions that it does raise is who gets to judge? And so one of the things that happens with cultural appropriation is people don't talk about, usually, the art or the content of the art or the, the novel or the, whatever is under, under the debate of, of controversy. They talk about the person, right? Bob Marley is insufficiently pure to wear those dreadlocks, right? He's the wrong kind of person. And it's like, oh, right? So now are we talking about art or are we talking about culture or are we talking about individuals and so quickly and so often what you see is it shifts from oh you know i think this plot element in your novel makes no sense because you've misunderstood this culture you're trying to set it in it's, it's a one different kind of criticism from saying you're not the kind of person who can write about this culture those are see those are two entirely different claims um, about, about an artwork. One is about the work, another is about the person. And I think one of the things that happened is we've grown so uncomfortable and so almost illiterate in a way about discussing art, art history, cultural issues and phenomenon that what we found is it's very much easier to, when we're much more comfortable uh, attacking individuals and attacking them for things that we think are, are are clear. And so then we make it about a person, and now the artist or the writer or whoever is put in the position of having to defend not their work, um, but themselves. Like, I'm the wrong, you, how do you defend yourselves against being who you are, right? Can I not be inspired by Japanese manga if I'm, you know, a, a young American? answer is you absolutely can because millions and millions and millions of young Americans and people all over the world by the way have been inspired by you know it's one of these crazy you know a relatively small relatively strange culture in Japan uh, that's very xenophobic which is hilarious has this global impact because of these crazy art forms that they've developed that go back to these you know very old traditions of, of graphic novels in, in all their many kinds of forms go back hundreds of years and the world discovered these and went you know what this is really great and so all over the world now there are these uh, versions of the Japanese graphic novel tradition that have just exploded and you're like wow again is this you know, should we judge the people and go, you're not the kind of person who can do a Japanese novel, or should we judge the work and go, oh, no, this is a bad, this is a bad thing. You just, you just, you just did bad. Like, this is no good, like, for the whatever reason. And so one th thing I'm very hesitant on, always makes me nervous, is when people go, oh, um, you know, let's talk about this work of art, and then one second later they're talking about the person who made it. I was like, mm, yeah, uh, the always be. So I'm always leery of this. Uh, uh, by the way, this is the Heidegger problem in philosophy, right? Like, you know, he's, uh, like, wow, yeah, third rate, third rate human being at best. Also, the, you know, Va Wagner problem in opera, right? Like, oh, good lord, like horrible, like you know, really, really not good people, right? Great, check, got it. Um, but you know, is there some value in the philosophy? Is there some like, ah, how, how do you disambiguate? These are, these are not simple questions. Um, second, eh, besides it almost immediately turns to the person rather than to the work and whether the work is of quality and meaningful, is, and then also it's always weird to me, like who gets to decide who is doing, whom is doing the cultural appropriation in the wrong way, right? Like, so if I'm, a, if, if I'm a Rastafari living in Jamaica, raised in the tradition, 
then do I do I do I ha, am I do I'm in the right place to criticize Bob Marley? Does that make it okay for me to criticize him? Um, or am I someone who was not raised in the tradition or whatever the culture is that we're uh, discussing? And but I feel like I need to defend. Like who gets to be the judge? And the problem here is. Ooh, because also cultural appropriation talks about power dynamics, right? Like it's it's usually uh, uh, it's 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 wrong. And again, this is a very vexed question: when stronger, more powerful, larger cultures appropriate material from smaller, weaker uh, cultures, right? Like this is usually usually the power dynamic that's discussed. So apparently, if you're a small society, you can take anything you want from anybody, and that's groovy. But if you're a big culture, a big powerful culture, it's not so good. Well, obviously, this is this is of dubious uh, itself. But it, you know, at least you have that power dynamic. But you often see this in the the, the judgment case. So it's like, ooh, how do the people who are making the judgments get their power? Like, where's the dynamic? Why are they authorized? Like, this is why crime is so much easier and theft. Because we actually have a judicial system set up to, you know, imperfect in many ways. But, you know, at least we know why the judges are there. We know how the system works, right? Blah, 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 all, all of that. But in this sort of cultural realm, it's rarely very much about any formal process with rules and understood guidelines for fair treatment and evidence and all these kinds of legal things that sound like niceties but really make legal systems work. Um, it's like, oh, do, do just it's anybody in some position, like if I'm a, a professor, do I get to just say to somebody, like, you're culturally appropriating, therefore you're a bad person, therefore, you know, don't. How, you know, you know where's that power dynamic work out? Where, where do the judges stand uh, and why do they get to judge? Always a good question to ask. And often, again, I feel like the way these questions are framed, they are not framed as questions or discussions but as accusations, and now somebody, whoever is on the, like Bob Marley, is supposed to spend his time defending himself, or uh, some other person is supposed to defend themselves, because again, their work isn't being attacked. At least they could maybe think about defending that, although whether they should or not is a question. Again, one of my favorite quotes from Miles Davis, when he says, uh, when, when an art critic said to him something like that, something about, like, what do you say to people uh, and critics who say your art has become inaccessible, and he said, I don't say anything, I just drive off in my Ferrari, right? Like, <laughs> this is sort of like, okay, I don't, I'm not going to spend any time defending my work, I'm just going to do it, right? So whether they should even bother to engage in these discussions is, is an open question, like right? perhaps, and I'm often fearful of this, I think it, it could probably quite damaging and limiting and undermining to the whole world of inspiration and productivity. And so, but it would be more helpful if these were discussions and explorations. Often they feel much more like uh, witch trials, which is why I ask, where do people get the authority to judge? Because um, if you set up a tribunal that's supposed to get witches, they will find witches. If you set up a tribunal to find communists, they find communists. If you have a tribunal that's set up to find, you know, whatever it is, they always find them, right? Like this is the nature of the, the problem of these sorts of cultural tribunals. Give them something to find and, and sure enough, they'll dig them up. And so it's like, hey, you know, this is undermining and destructive of the process. Is this supportive and helpful? Discussions, explorations you know, maybe maybe so. Um, but just this judgment and attacks that put, you know, artists theoretically on the defensive mm, is, is always, you know, that that's troubling to me because they're, they're supposed to be doing things. And they say, oh, well, this is intellectual this and intellectual that. Well, are artists supposed to be intellectuals? Right? Is, this, is this one of the requirements and why? They don't need to be intellectuals. They need to do art. Right? They need to be create, they need to produce, they need to make. For some things, if you're going to be a philosopher, it probably helps to be an intellectual. If you're, but if you're a painter, who, you need all these fucking words for it, right? It's useless, it doesn't help you maybe. And so uh, often the projects that aren't words uh, get flushed with words, and all of a sudden you're like, you can't see the art anymore because all these words are in the way. Um, and, and again, some of my favorite examples of, of what, of, of, the opposite of this is um, in the Indian, North Indian classical music tradition, and I talked about this, I think, before, 
Baba Khan, Alauddin Khan, was the teacher of, of Ravi Shankar, Nikhil Banerjee, and Ustad Ali Akbar Khan, which is, he was just, you know, this is ridiculous. He was an amazing teacher, and he produced these three students more or less contemporaneously. And he encouraged uh, Ravi Shankar to go out and play Indian classical music around the world, which, of course, all kinds of people heard it for the first time, and then, like, the Beatles got influenced by it, and then it comes into popular culture. And you can stop and say at every step, like, no, you shouldn't do this. Like, oh, this is outside the tradition. Some of this has very strong spiritual and religious context. It's definitely outside, often... These are or uh, ragas or have specific times of the days they're supposed to be played. None of this or like all this is lost. All the cultural here they tell story, religious stories often are built in or, or from the epics are sometimes built in that, that in the ragas that are just lost, right? So ah, like so much is lost. But what a great gift was given to the world by doing this. And this was Baba Khan's idea is that if if it stays in India, if North Indian classical music only stays in the certain parts of India for a clique of people who are interested in this music, it will die, right, on one hand. On the other hand, if we spread it, again, Ustad Ali Akbar Khan, he told him to go set up a, a school in the United States to train this, and it has been hugely influential and effective, and this is how I encountered North Indian classical music for the first time. And again, this amazing gift was given to the world to be shared, to be listened to, to be circulated, and it's worked. I mean, North Indian classical music has a much greater presence in the global music scene than it did, you know, 50 years ago when no one had ever heard of a sitar. If you weren't in India, probably chances of that you had heard a sitar, yeah, very, very small. Today, even people have no interest in it, none of the, they would recognize the sound. You say, what's the sound like? Oh, yeah, I recognize that. So, okay, that's a sitar. Okay, great. All over the world, right? Now, is this wrong? Is this, ah, I mean, these sorts of questions, they're vexed all the time. And you can say, yeah, they're out of context. They're being commercialized. Uh, they're being taken by people who have no idea of the history or traditions. They're being reproduced in all kinds of ways. Uh, who knows who created these ragas originally? They're not getting paid because, you know, the, nobody, I mean, many lost to history, much argument about other aspects of it. Is a raga actually a song? Like, I mean, our modern copyrights and might not even qualify. All these questions are still there. Uh, and so that's, that's another one. A another great one of these examples is Peter Gabriel has been accused of... Um, cultural appropriation because good lord if anybody's been inspired by global musical trends it's peter gabriel but here's a guy who was literally went almost bankrupt uh trying to do womad the world organization of music and dance i mean this is a peter gabriel project almost went bankrupt trying to get this flying which eventually he did and he did a reunion tour with uh, his old band uh, Genesis just to raise money to keep himself well they actually helped him do this so that he wouldn't go bankrupt having done one of the first WOMAD festivals and so you go oh so this is and so I look at these examples and I go wow do you are, are we supposed to limit that is he is, is Peter Gabriel not supposed to hear um, music in in Africa and go wow I love that rhythm I want to use it is that wrong is that is that rhythm not for peter gabriel for some reason because he's from england um, and he plays and he's a rock musician therefore he can't have african rhythm which makes no sense in any way because of course west african rhythms are the underground under roots of you know rock music that's very clear um so you know so he's just cutting out a few centuries of travel and going straight to the source you know, and it's such an odd thing. And if you go again to the Lascaux Caves, which I recommend, um, when I was there, the shows rotate, but when I was there, they had a show up of, as part of the tour, of art that was uh, inspired by the, uh, paint, the paintings of artists who had come to see the paintings, inspired by them, and then produced from, from, for many decades. So this is a huge collection of art from artists all over the world of different kinds of all you just just and they're like okay these artists came they saw they got inspired and then they did something pretty amazing and great and it's like ah right and so obviously um in all of these cases it's like 
they are appropriate. All these artists and are, are appropriating and taking and using cultural ideas that are not quote unquote native to them. But again, notice the argument that had to say it's not native to them is to say there's some part of the human experience and there's some part of human culture that's not okay for other people to share. Right? That's the this is this is where I really struggle with this. Now, it is not to say that people don't do bastardly things. Of course, people do bastardly things all the time. And but again, Often in these, in, and when people talk about cultural appropriation, it's, ah, it's, it, you know, it's vexed. It's like, okay, did the person mean to harm people? Does, is, the, is the use of the work destructive? So, for instance, this is one of the questions I think, I, again, I don't hear. So one of the examples I came across, which just sort of really drives me crazy, is they said that, oh, uh, a non-Mexican should not be able to open a Mexican restaurant and use traditional Mexican recipes because they're not Mexican. Now, what this would do to world cuisine would be to just sort of stop the distribution of good food because you're saying only people who are joined within a particular dietary cooking tradition can ever anywhere in the world reproduce that food. Well, this is in, this is just this is nonsense. A, uh, and by the way, this is from an actual article that I read. They said the food of Mexico, which is, I mean, anybody in Mexico, anybody who's been to Mexico, anybody who's vaguely familiar with Mexico will realize there is no food of Mexico. Mexico has a whole lot of food from a whole lot of different regions, incredible variation. Go to Mexico and eat. Your life will be better. Like, it's just good all the time. I mean, it's it's just amazing, but there's not a food of Mexico, right? This is this is itself is like this a cultural ignorance of, of such a profound level that when I saw the article, I almost thought about not talking about it, but it does it is sort of create this sort of extreme, which is probably not fair. But, you know, you do see these arguments made. And it's like, well, hey, how then would you share the cuisine of the world? And do we not want the cuisine of the world to be shared? I went to Mexico. I tasted the food. I'm not a cook. I would never do this. I was inspired. I thought, oh, I want to take this flavors back to France. Or I want to take these flavors to Spain or to India or wherever I am. And I want to go, look, taste this. And, and this happens, of course. And then people all over the world go to restaurants and go, oh, my God, this is amazing. This is incredible. And, you know, these flavors, these mixes, these textures, this is, this is great and wondrous. Why would you say, but only certain people can do this? Right, like oh, you're not the right again. Notice this is back to this, not the food. Now, if you go and make crap Mexican food, people should absolutely complain and say, "Don't do that." Right, so don't make crap Mexican food. That's a bad thing. But if you make good Mexican food, like why do I care if you're from Mexico? Like, do I care? I know I care about the food. Right, again. So notice where the the, the judgment has missed. Um, and now, what would be great, of course, is, is and this is back to the question of attribution. It was to say, like, hey, you know, this is from this region of Mexico. These are the ingredients they tend to use. Here's why, right? You can put it in all this context and make it sort of valuable and shareable. And then the people of experience can then pass it along. And so, you know, these are the questions I would ask when you're encountering, when you raise, like, oh, is this an issue of cultural appropriation? Is it appropriate? And one question to ask, is it destructive or inspiring and productive? Does it make it likely that we're going to get more North Indian classical music? Does it make it likely we're going to get more um, manga? Does it make it likely that we're going to get more anime and we're going to get more Mexican cuisine? Or does it mean that it is destructive of it, that it somehow destroys the source, that it damages the thing that produces it? Because that could be very real, too. If you're saying, oh, this food I'm serving comes from this very rare area, and to serve it, I have to kill that. So that, you know, over time, we're going to no longer have that food available. Well, that is a real dangerous issue. That's a, that's a you know, that now we're talking not just cultural appropriation, but cultural destruction. This, this demeans, destroys, and makes it impossible for this to be shared, for this to, to prosper, for this to spread beyond into new areas and to grow. And so rather than, you know, so... I would just like to, you know, reframe these questions somewhat and say, hey, is this a use that expands, grows, spreads, and enriches, or is this one that destroys, um, limits, and in some way demeans? Those are real questions.
right, to me. Uh, th th those are the real ones. And the problem is, if you're one of the first kinds of these tube kinds that I mentioned, like if you're doing a theft or a crime, you don't care. If you're trying purposefully to do this, you don't care. And so generally, the only people who are really being accused of cultural appropriation are people who are not trying to do this. And so they probably think either it doesn't matter or that they're trying to do inspirational things. They've been inspired. They want to share. They want to grow. They want to participate. And so, again, this, right? So then in some ways, it's almost as if the whole cultural appropriation project is often pointed at the least uh, problematic sector, right? Like, oh, you know, I, I, you know, the people can be ignorant. Absolutely. But can they probably be, you know, helpfully reguided sure um, but are they really the people who are the threat or is it the people who are actively trying to destroy things or actively trying to undermine it seems like that would be more the people you should point your your interest at and but yet this doesn't seem to be often there and so these th that's why I, you know, the way it's framed is often so upsetting and disturbing to me and again this raises again to the question of judgment because if somebody knows they're trying to do something wrong and they're doing it on purpose and you say, oh, you shouldn't do that here, I'm going to shame you, which is often the approach taken, well, it doesn't work because they're happy about that. They know that what they're doing works. If someone does it inadvertently and you try to shame them, it might work, but now notice that this is not like they might feel bad, but what, how does that help? Right? Trying to make people feel bad does not help inspire, improve, right, spread, or grow a tradition. That's, that's really the, the core of this. And so it's, this is in no way not to say that these aren't real issues, because they are real issues, and they do come up. But again, the way they're often framed, the way uh, the judgments are cast so quickly and so adamantly, and the notion of who gets to judge all this stuff and why they get to be in the position to make these decisions, um, it's, it often makes me nervous because so many of the examples, like I said, Bob Marley, Peter Gabriel, North Indian classical music, the, paint, the cave paintings of Lascaux, all fall under this category of cultural appropriation. And, I, and I'm all for it. I'm like, no, no, call, you know, appropriate this because uh, this needs to be appropriated. And if it's not, then we're in trouble. And that would be the last thing I would leave with is a lot of this, um, not all of it, but a lot of it has to do with these notions of identity. And it is, this is a very interesting uh, way. It's, if people want to construct identity by creating scarcity, I care only five of these, and if I can have one, then I'm unique, and this makes me valuable. But scarcity in culture um, is, is not, I don't want to say death, but it is not helpful Right? If you only have five people who speak your language, that makes it very rare. That makes you very unique. That also makes it very likely your language is about to die. Right? You, you, you want spread. You want growth. Um, and, and that's a tension. I, I'm not going to say there's even an absolute answer here, but it's definitely a tension. And I think too often when I hear about these discussions of identity uh, and a restriction, it's like, oh, people are trying to defend scarcity so that they can maintain specificity and, and, and identity. And the history of this is pretty clear. In lots of instances, this leads you know, uh, to extinction, to extinction of the culture, of the ideas of, of whatever that it was trying to make special. So uh, you know, this is um, famously, there's a, uh, what was, it's Mozart. This was an example that I was pondering. Um, who went to the Vatican, and there was music that was never played outside the Vatican, and they had like a secret library of music. And then, you know, people would go, they'd hear the music, and they'd be like, oh my God, like the, you know, it's sort of a way of being impressive. And Mozart, of course, being Mozart, was like, oh, I've heard it, I'll just score it, right? And so that music then became available. And it's like, ah, it did, in fact, maybe in some small way dim diminish the power of the Vatican, but it enriched humanity. And they're like, ah. And so, but but if if you have one copy of that music at the Vatican and there's a fire or a war or an invasion, which yes, 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 uh, 
it's gone, right? Because it wasn't shared. It wasn't distributed. It wasn't disseminated. Like somehow if something can go wrong in India and all Indian class, North Indian classical music would be gone from India, let us say. It's, you know, outlawed. It's driven underground. You know, I don't know. I don't know. Um, something happens. It would live on. Right? It's, it's spread enough, there's enough schools, there's enough players, there's enough recordings, there's enough everything outside now India that it could live on, uh, even if India, uh, for some reason, decided that they don't do music anymore, which would be very un-Indian, but you know, it, you know it's, it's if whatever, some un unbelievable catastrophe. And the, you know, th thinking about those models, right? So scarcity and rarity uh, in themselves are dangerous for culture, for civilization, for languages, for art, right? And while it does give uniqueness and it does help in some ways shore up identity associated with those things, uh, it's a very risky and dangerous path to go down to try and say, to, to limit ever smaller groups. And again, this is the problem that if you go back to the Bob Marley example, if only pure Rastafari in parts of Jamaica where this is practiced to those very tight specifications were ever allowed to communicate or spread this word or be inspired by this, no one would ever have heard of this, right? It, it would, not, would not have spread. It would not be known. Um, and so you're like, ah, well, when does that die? When, when does, does it it would just be dead, right? Probably would, you know, may, may or may not have died out by now, but it would certainly be tiny and unknown. And yet, for some reason, now people know about it. And so, yeah, so these tensions are there and need to be very carefully thought about. And, and yet, so often, I just don't think they are. At least I don't hear about it in the debate that rage around these things. I'm like, hey, let's not forget that if we're going to make an error, probably we want to err on the side of more people, more examples, more um, because if you if you just keep restricting and making things narrow and narrower and allowing fewer and fewer people to participate or to access or to be inspired and feel that inspiration, then at some point, right, it's it dies. You know, if it's not shared and reproduced and vibrant and vital and then communities are, are thriving. And then again, the, the, right back to the question I asked away, is it shared in a way that it destroys the community? Is it shared in a way that it enriches, enhances, and grows the community? You know, if, if we ask those kinds of questions um, and, and phrase them as questions rather than as judgment and as charges, then I think it's, it's very much easier than to look at someone like Bob Marley and go, yeah, yeah, all of these charges are correct. He did commercialize. He did break the integrity. He, you know, he wasn't doing his dreadlocks the way they wanted him to. However, on the flip side, he did enrich the community by millions and millions of people, spread the ideas, got the voice out, inspired and influenced and created. He grew it. He did not deplete it by any, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and so if we're asking questions of growth, contribution, inspiration, and uh, influence, rather than of personal merit or value or identity, wow, you get very different answers to these questions, and I often think more useful. So, um, yeah, just a, a, a quick reflection on this issue that has come up more commonly, and I think it is, it is vexed. And again, I'm not saying there are no controversies here and there's not things to consider and, and ponder um, but it, you know I often think the way it's framed who gets to judge the fact that we're judging people rather than work that we're not asking about growth and contribution and inspiration rather asking about identity and and who has the authority and right to do stuff uh, often misses the mark and is less productive and actually inhibits the creation and inspiration of art rather than contributes to it. And it inhibits the spread and growth of the very cultures that are supposedly being protected rather than helping them grow and spread. So cultural appropriation, thank you very much.